recording. Okay, now I'm recording. For sure I'm recording. Hello everybody, <laughs> today we've got Ali Pettigrew, who's the host of Right This Minute on the show. What's up, Ali? Hello. How you doing, Ali? Coming to you live from the Right This Minute studio. No shenanigans going on here whatsoever. Everything is to No, I'm in front of a green screen. How's everything? Oh. oh, I was I so sold excited. Oh no, the mystery's out. Why would you do that? Uh, okay, now for uh, those of you guys who are listening, first of all, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Are We Podcasting Yet? Uh, super honored actually to have our good buddy Ollie on the show today or on the podcast. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, although I'm sure most of you do, Ollie started his career out in Singapore in Southeast Asia, television hosting and emceeing out there. And uh, one of the cool things is Ollie's actually the reason that Justin and I even know each other. Very true. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I adopted. And also both. possibly the reason we got our first jobs. Actually, no, for sure the reason yeah. we got our first jobs. <laughs> oh yeah, you guys. No, no. You guys, you're my rescue hosts. I'm like, you know, I, 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 got, I brought them in and I gave them a home, you know, just to show them how to do it. It's great, you know. It's like, yeah. like the RSPCA. Thanks for showing but, us the ropes. It's great, you know. All he left for greener pastures, and we took any piece of work he left behind. <laughs> not any. Guys, uh, all, not all every. Of it. Did not, did not care what it was. No, that'll work. Was Ollie going to do it? He can't? I'll do it. I'll do it. Half the price? Yeah, sure. That's fine. I'll, I'll oh, do it. No. Uh, you know what? Don't pay me. Don't pay me. What was Ollie's sure, rate? He asked for money? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's crazy is this, talk. Is this just going to be the truth about Asian television? It's just going to be brutal. We're, we're going to work our way there. Oh, oh we're going there. Uh, okay, so I wanted to start off actually talking just a little bit about the collective. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, that's actually something that all three of us are a part of. And it's a... Uh, it's actually a group that Ollie and his wife started. Uh, God, how many years ago, Ollie? It was. Oh, well, I, the, the boy was, uh, he's, how long, how old's my kid? 12? So 11 years old, I, I think. I, something I, like that. Oh, wow. Mahini as well. It was me, it was me, Zen and Mahini were the ones that, uh, that started it. Because um, we'd all just, we'd, you know, we knew Mahini and we'd all been in the industry for a while at that point. And, uh, and we were all just frustrated. Like we just couldn't find any kind of representation as as internationals, and I'd been told I wasn't marketable, and um, and it was just like no, we'd like, well, this is stupid. No one's going to fight harder than than for us, and so our creation of the the collective was just to create the the perception of an agency, but where we all just ran it ourselves and managed ourselves, and I guess what it was about finding was finding like-minded individuals, and then people who were like, if we all work together we can all rise together because everyone else in Asia was undercut, 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 mm -hmm. undercut. And it was just race to the bottom about who could be the cheapest for a job where we're like, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and Adam's like, yeah, I could do that. Um, so yeah, you guys were in phase two, weren't you? I you think so. Phase two. I didn't realize we had our own phase. Yeah. yeah. We were like, we were like the millennial generation of the, of the collective. Although yeah, I, I just called us millennials. So. The, way, well, the way we used to spot talent was just by watching television. And it all came about is like other people I like watching. I was like, oh, that guy's good. You know, you'd see, we'd see like that, that's, that person's, that person's pretty good. And back in the day, you know, you just go on to, what were they? There was Alive Not Dead. And there was like Twitter. Oh, yeah. And these places you mm -hmm. could find people and just reach out. And that's, yeah. that's how a lot of us just got to know each other. It was just like, hey, man, I like what you do. You should talk to us. We can maybe help you out. Like, I remember when I first met you guys, Ollie, I thought it was one of the, not only one of the strangest ideas that I'd, I'd heard of in entertainment, but also one of the most interesting and maybe beneficial because especially, I mean, Justin, we talk about this all the time, mm. especially out in Southeast Asia, management and agencies are just, they're not what you want them to be. They don't, they mm. don't feel as though they yeah. work for you. Es and so- Especially then. Yeah, um, definitely. Then I, I mean, I think it's getting better in some regards now, um, but back then, shoot, man, because I was signed with an agency for a year and a half, and they did nothing. They they took jobs from me to give to other people. Well, that was the thing that, that bothered me, is that yeah. you, you'd you'd hear, you know, because it's a small place, the industry, and you, a lot of people small. talk, and. Um, and it was kind of the idea that, uh, you know, someone approached me and, oh, I, I wanted you for this job, but, you know, they said that I had to take these people. Or, you know, basically, it's like you're, you know, it's like I am host A, and instead of negotiating my job, they go, I'll tell you what, I'll give you host A for half the price if you agree to take 
B, C, and D for other jobs. And so you wait, hang on, you used me as a negotiation to get me less money so you as an agency could make more money. That's not what we're supposed to do here. You're supposed to work for me, for my jobs, and give me priority on this, give them priority on their jobs. And that's like, that's, hang on a second, I'm not a negotiating tool for you to then exploit and make less money. So I kind of realized that honestly, I was paying 25% of my, my income for people to do literally just schedule. Fuck you over. I wasn't, I yeah. wasn't, I was at the point of my, my, my career right at the beginning where I kind of blown up quite quickly, quite big. I'd gone from one project to three projects to four projects. And I'm like, suddenly I'm on a bunch of networks. So people just found me. So all I ended up doing was creating ollipettigrew.com and creating an email address. And that is how I found 99% of my work for the rest of the time I worked in Asia. People would just email me directly and I'd be yeah. in like on my phone, I go, yeah, I can do that job. Okay, so I got a question then because you're actually one of the only friends of mine as well as entertainers that we know who has successfully transitioned from a Southeast Asian entertainment market to an American Western market. Is it different? So let's start with management. We we're talking about agencies and management. Does it feel different in California, Arizona, Los Angeles, or does it feel exactly the same? No, it's, it's completely night and day. Um, I, when I was in Asia, I wouldn't let, uh, once we got started with the collective and it was sort of rolling, I would never let anybody else handle my, my stuff. I negotiate for me, I, you know, I dealt with everything. I had control, um, but America is completely different. In Asia, I kicked down doors and just said, hey, I wanna be on television. Yeah. In America, you cannot even walk through that door unless someone they know has already told them that you are a legit. Oh yeah, so, at, at least several people. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. So this woman, like she set me up. I turn up in LA, uh, I've got nowhere to stay. I stay with this random guy called Justin Wilman, who ends up, you know, he's blown up now. And then um, while I was there, I had meetings every day. One of those meetings um, was for my, my agent, um, where I just walked in and she, we, me and her vibe, instantly she says i saw your reel i've never seen anything like it um i'd love to sign you and then when we got into the conversation she asked me what's the most important thing for you when it comes to work and i said ethics you know i said if if i say i'm going to do something i'll do it if you say i'm going to do that we stick we don't mess people around we don't we don't do that that's just the way we do it and she goes this is how i like to do business and that was it and babette has just believed in me from the beginning yeah and um you know, and she had no idea that you were totally lying to her the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just you thinking the her. worst person. Yeah, you just <laughs> lie right in her face. That's how you, so that's how you get work in LA. You lie? Is that what we're yeah, right. no, just actually, you get, you actually, get yes. other people, that's... other people to do it for you. You get that. That's it's, that's the difference in, in Asia. You can do it by yourself in America. You honestly can't. I mean, you and uh, a, a couple other people helped open the door up for Alan and I, and then mm -hmm. coronavirus closed the door like really hard, like the, right on our faces. Just as you were. Did you guys bring coronavirus to America? Because the timing I, of it I don't is know. incredible. Yeah, we're not sure. We're not sure. It's, a, might it's have a mild concern. It's it's no joke. It's, it's, it's brutal. I mean, you talk about every industry right now. You talk about the 40 yeah. million people unemployed. It's, it's brutal for everyone. And we've seen a lot of shows. Are you, you know, you saw E! News die the other day, right? And what? you, know, I, you no, didn't I see didn't that. that. E! News, what e -news died. Yeah, it's gone. What? Yeah. It's gone? It's gone. E! News, after 19 years, that's done. Are you um, serious? He, yeah. HBO Warner laid off like 500 people. I've seen shows that have been oh furloughing dozens God. of people. I was feeling really good in February. Like, I was... He was. <laughs> I, was I, can, yeah. I was feeling the flow. I was like, Alan, get your ass down here. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. This is happening. Alan's like, yes, not a problem. I'm going to sign a lease in my apartment. Let's go. And then, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, so tough, man. So tough. Yeah. It is what it is. At it least is. now, when we make our own content from our, our our apartments, it's the same quality level as like the big network shows. There's oh. no difference. <laughs> dare, dare I say? Hundred percent the chief. It's, this it's, might be a bit out. higher. This might be a bit higher than some of the stuff we've done, Justin. Oh, let's, not, oh, let's not pretend. For hundred percent, especially with yeah. Ollie's green screen. Yeah, yeah this so is, you're, you're not, bringing a whole... <laughs> you're not wrong, though. And the, th the interesting thing to think about is, is how is coronavirus going to change the way television is made? Because you got, like I said, right this minute is a pretty unique, sort of when it comes to national TV and stuff like that, we are the little engine that could. This show was born out of the last recession as a way of doing television, but more streamlined, 
you know, just cheaper. People are going to see that the way right this minute is made is probably the way that television is going to need to be made in a way. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But especially at a time like this, the coronavirus, yeah. name another show that you, our show has not really changed. We've got the animated background. We do it through Zoom, just like you guys do. But it's still me and the guys having our conversations and showing the videos. And the videos are what pull people in and the comments mm. and why people come back. They like us. Like our show well, still feels 95% the same. And yeah. you watch others and it's like, oh, it's weird like this. They're in their front room. Like you're saying, it's weird to watch the, the evening guys doing their jokes it's with no laughter and stuff. I've well, gotten used to it now, but at first it was an adjustment. They got used to it too. I don't know if you guys yeah. have been watching kind of what, you know, let's say Stephen Colbert or Trevor mm. Noah or Seth Meyers were doing. I noticed that they had an adjustment period because, I mean, going from a live studio audience to you know, wherever in their house they were filming is a huge difference, right? So their timings with jokes is what I noticed first. You would notice that sometimes yeah. they would give a pause for like an audience <laughs> response and then there's no audience response and it kind of messes their transition up into the next Very thing. True. But Justin, I know you watch Seth Meyers. He has completely yeah. transformed his delivery where he doesn't pause at all after his no. punchlines. He burns straight through them and I think it's just a different technique. Oh, it's, it, it's totally different. I mean, obviously not having a live audience versus having one are two separate things as, as us three know. And I just imagine for those guys, it was just doing the same show without an audience. Like your brain just doesn't immediately flip over. Right. So but then even your big franchise shows like you guys have been hosting, like the, the Got Talents, uh, the American yeah. Idols, the things like that, you know, you can't, you can't throw 50,000 people in a room and try to figure out who can sing. No. You know? Well, okay. <laughs> like, it also depends on where you are, right? So we had one of our friends, uh, Ann Winterson on, and she's in Taiwan and things are back up and normal. Yeah. Like in Singapore, yeah. production is also starting to get going. It's just funny that COVID really found a nice home here in America. It's just very comfortable it's, here in America. Yeah, we really did. It's, we really rolled out the red carpet, didn't we? Lots of it's, easy prey. You guys are last, so it's first. That's what I've heard, right? That, that's, that's the new thing. No, no, last means we're first. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy to be in the middle of this. I'm in, I base in Arizona. So we're like ground zero on, at this point on earth. One of the worst places that you can be for coronavirus. That's currently where I live. So I'm on, I just did the number. I'm a hundred day, 157 of social distancing for our wow. family. Yeah. And like, it's going to be a year period, real quick. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be, I told my, I told my daughter expect it to be 18 months. Um, you know, wow. um, I, I'm just using the example of history. You know, and I think all of your answers that you're looking for are in history. And the last time the world did something like this, it was 1918, was that the, the pandemic, the Spanish flu. And it lasted, it lasted 18 months before it kind of yeah. finally petered out. And it was the same. It was a big spike and a couple million people died. And then everyone said, oh, it's not real. And then 50 million people died. And, you know, I don't think Corona is, is that dangerous compared to, say, Spanish flu, because we yeah. have better health care and stuff like that. But just like you're saying is, to look at a country like South Korea that had it three months before it ever got to America and that they've had something like 400 deaths. And then you come to America and we've had 170,000. And it's crazy. And it's just, people are almost numb to it in a way. And it, yeah. it is mind blowing when you, you just go, guys, we're literally doing 10,000% worse <laughs> than, than basically any other country. Just like we, we are su just sucking to agree of 10,000. And that's what you're oh. saying is because the frustration for me is everyone just shut up and put on a mask and just yeah. follow the protocols. We could get back to work. We could start things going. There could be an element of normalcy. We could be watching sports. There are, I've seen people with rugby games in New Zealand and people at baseball games in Taiwan. I'm like, we could do that. You just have to stop being so obsessed with your freedoms. But Ollie, the, it's, it's the freedom, the freedom. My mouth needs to be free. <laughs> So I can't, I, I want to, my mouth needs to be liberated as much as uh, possible. Justin, I feel like many people out there would strongly disagree with this statement. Let's, uh, you should, let's put you a should lock charge for your it. mouth, buddy. Don't make it for free. Come and take it. You know, and so all this craziness is going on in America. And also we have one of the most important elections of our lifetime about to happen. It's like, yeah. how come all of this has to happen at the same time? That's hey, what, 2020. That's, Oh, don't even say yeah. the numbers. Are we, are we allowed to swear on your podcast? Yes, yeah, you can fuck fucking it. swear as much fuck, as you fucking fuck want. Fuck 2020, man. That's, fuck that for it. me is what a, it's just fuck it right in the ear. What a, what a sucking uh, year. But uh, it's what, what are some what are some pros 
for 2020 for you guys? Okay, you know, I, I like this. Let's switch this it is around. Good. What are Let's, some good things that have happened because of 2020? Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Uh, Ollie. Uh, for me, it's uh, one, I get to spend a lot more time with my children. Mm -hmm. So I don't like get much time off and I'm going to, you know, I'm sending the kids to school, going to work, coming back and they're going to sleep. So now I'm home, I'm around them, I'm hanging out. We're just, we're connecting, we're talking. And, uh, you know, it's like, for me, that's been good because for the first three years, I was actually separated from a, from a, by a thousand miles from them. So that's a positive, spending a lot more time Definitely. with my family. What about, what about you, you Alan? Wong is going. Oh, you know what? Not so dissimilar from what you're saying, except I don't have children, so, or a wife, so different in that small <laughs> mm -hmm. facet. But no, I've also been able to spend a lot more time with my family. In particular, my 99 year old grandmother. Jeez. Who, uh, is killing it, by the way. Yeah. Like, she, she can remember my phone number, like, by heart, in her head. And it's a new number. I've only had it for, like, five months. What's your um, phone number? Uh, <laughs> six, six, nine. No, I'm not going to do that. Not happening. Not right here. Um, and you both, you both have it. And anyone who, you know, not that a lot of people are going to watch this who would want my number. But just. I don't know. I think this is, this is the show we break through on. This is the one that goes viral. <laughs> The yeah, it's this, maybe it's this one. It's Ollie. It's Ollie in the green it's just, screen. It's just this app. It's they say it's always the fifth show on podcasts. That's that's the rule, right? Fifth. The rule of fives with podcasts. The know, podcast guys. five rule. So wait, yeah. Justin, go on. Hit us with something positive about Corona. Yeah. Uh, I've had a shitload of time to just work on my own creative endeavors. Uh, write. Um, get get better at writing. Uh, part of a couple. Writer's room's up here in LA. I've learned a shitload. Uh, get better at editing. Been editing a, a bunch of different stuff uh, as far as uh, film and just like YouTube videos. Uh, just, yeah, just learning new stuff with regards to the craft that we all love so much. I need to do more of that. I've always been, like I said, lucky. So I've kind of been falling into people's productions. And one thing I was doing on the run-up to this was I was actually working with the, the production company that makes... Um, our show and I I pitched them a new one I think it's I think it's awesome that you want to put in more of your creative endeavors let me help you with that a little bit it really helps um when you want to work on your creative endeavors to not have a job and <laughs> like and it's just this whole thing where like you don't have something that you know you don't, you don't even have to worry about making money because it's not an option reruns of ages got talent are playing right now Alan oh dude I, Re I still really? have reruns yeah yeah how great that's a, that's... that we will never get money from that yeah. No, we will not. Yeah, so many of my shows, like I got paid, like, I guess like the difference as well about Asia and America was the money. That's why. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Because, What's like, money in America like? Well, I, like I said, you don't have to tell numbers, but this for, more, for me was very, very telling. That the very first raise I got in America um, as a pat on the back for, you do a good job, we like you, we want you to stay. That raise was more than I ever got paid to do a season of television. In Asia. Question: What's a raise? Raise, yeah. What is that? It's there's another thing. There you go. I've got a question for both you guys. Do it. Um, what would your advice be for somebody that's coming up as an actor or TV host in the entertainment industry in, say, Singapore or Southeast Asia versus LA? I'd say if you're starting off in Southeast Asia or Asia in general. Um, mm -hmm. And I only have Hong Kong and Singapore as my references, right? Uh, Justin, you have Bangkok. Um, I, I think you got to go out and meet people. And you go, got to go out and literally find advocates. One by one, convince someone that you're not only going to be something that's valuable in their career in the future, but something that they want to watch or they want to see. And it's person to person, you win someone over. And eventually you'll have won the right person over that you never knew might just come along and be like, hey, someone else I know is auditioning for something. Um, I told them that you might do it because I thought you were pretty awesome when I met you. And I think that is, that's at least what I learned from Ollie, actually. I think that was mm, the first couple of lessons sure. that, that Ollie and the collective passed along to me. And you know what? It, it worked. It's tiring and you're on all the time, but it does work. And now I know oh. it's different in LA, but actually well, yes, I've never been successful. I would think that as far as that goes, I think that, to be honest, is just as important in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it really, because the only way to get your opportunity, you can get opportunities in Southeast Asia 
without really networking. You may not necessarily seal the deal in a lot of them, but you can at least possibly get the opportunity because you know, you're, you're pretty or, or you're just good. Um, you can maybe get that opportunity because it's a little bit smaller. In LA, you're not getting an opportunity unless you know somebody. Mm -hmm. Regardless I, I, of how good, you could be the best, the best. If you don't know anybody, nobody fucking cares. That's, and that's a, my issue is uh, at the moment is because we are the only show, national show that doesn't produce in, uh, in California or New York. We're, we're mm. based in Phoenix, which is great because I'm removed from all the bullshit. I could literally just, I, you know, until the <laughs> shutdown, I'd get in my truck, I'd drive six miles to the studio, I'd go and do my television show, I'd get back in the truck, I'd go home. It's nice, relaxing, hang out with my kids. But, um, but I'm removed from, from the LA of it all. So honestly, my, my connections are, are pretty, pretty meager yeah. uh, compared to the way it was, like, like say in Asia, whereas in Asia, like I told you guys, like my, I got my first big job because I drunkenly dared the, the managing director of, uh, of AXN to put me on television. I was like, you should give me that show and I'll make it better. So I just dared him about this show, give it to me. And that was Sony style. Um, but he took me out to lunch like a couple of days later and he says, are you serious? And I went, yeah. And he goes, all right, but if you fuck it up, it's on you. And, <laughs> and that was it. But I got the show and it went well. But that's like you just said about being small and about people knowing each other and having an advocate. I was doing that show and my buddy Julius was, was directing and he told his friend who played PlayStation with Nick. Nick worked at HBO. And uh, so Nick brought me in and I got a job on HBO and it created EPAD. And then Nick, at the time, had a girlfriend who worked at a production company that was making Lonely Planet. So he recommended mm. me to her. And that's how I got my first three biggest gigs was literally just word of mouth from a crew that all played PlayStation together. There you go. You so never know like, how. It's absolutely about people you fucking know. And it's absolutely, you never know who you're talking to mm -hmm. and you never know who they know. So, I just well, what, what about thing. advice as far as during a global pandemic? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this this probably goes even when it's not when we're not during a global pandemic. Just be good at Instagram. I get, <laughs> I'm, I'm rubbish. I'm at least rubbish for at now, Instagram. at least for the next year. I didn't even two. start doing an Instagram. So I, I just was very I was such an old man about Instagram. No, this is where you take artful pictures and post. And like the suddenly Instagram stories turned up and I just didn't get it. Just didn't get Instagram stories. But now there's but reels. Was... What are the reels? Yeah, like, I know. Well, that's them trying to be TikTok. What's, there's Instagram reels. So what's an Instagram reel? To, it's basically their version of TikTok. Alan, it, Alan, if you, Alan, if you Alan, open Instagram, Alan, you need to learn how to do reels. I'm still learning Instagram about Instagram reels. Live. I don't even know what Instagram Live is. I live all the time. I don't need Instagram. It's to live. live. It's a live TV. But Everything honestly, in life is live. <laughs> But not, not the reels. Instagram this reels is aren't live. live. While we're making this, this is live, but it's not Instagram. But it's, live. we're, we're going to edit down the parts yeah, that we fuck up. Right. Yeah, which is a lot. It's, it's going to be great. You should, if you open Instagram, it literally just tries to sell it to you now. Like, literally, if you open Instagram right, right now, Instagram is trying to sell you. I just don't know what the difference is between that and the stories. Ah, Instagram What's, reels, no. Yeah, yeah there you go. You see it? It's right there. I don't know what it is, though. They want to try and sell it to you, but I don't get it either. But like, I, I didn't start doing stories until the first day of the lockdown. And I thought, well, the, what a unique and random thing that's happening right now. A lot of people are scared. And so I started just doing a, a daily Instagram story where I was like, okay, well, because the very first, again, credit to right this minute. I talk, these, talk about these guys a lot, but I tell you, they are an incredible group of people and they really care about the people they work for. And they're also not stupid, right? We saw this coming. They created 18 shows, essentially, behind the scenes. And then they came, brought us in and said, all right, guys, we're shutting down. We're going to shut down production for two weeks. Mm. There's going to be no break in broadcast because everyone's going to be seeing these, these, these mishmash shows. And in those two weeks, we're going to figure out how to produce this show remotely. And now we've been doing it for 150 something days. Like they, when other shows suddenly had to react, other shows suddenly yeah. had to shut down. We were already back and on Zoom. We you're were like doing the, the show. You're like the Taiwan of broadcast television. <laughs> It's lovely. Just you know, like we, Taiwan. We just saw it coming like and we had right to just like, minute in Taiwan. Oh, Taiwan. So Taiwan-like. Taiwan. Right Taiwan. So Taipei's of you. Um, Taiwan's awesome. No, okay. You know, you said it before, though, that right this minute did also happen to be perfectly tailored for these times. And I just want to talk about it a little bit because for anyone who may be listening from Asia um, who's tuning in and hasn't seen the show right this minute, um, basically, Ollie is a, a part of a team of hosts that get to introduce uh youtube videos that haven't been what is the number again they have to be below a certain viewership right well, no, we, it's just we honestly that it's, like, 
with a video with with a viral video show where you're going to see videos before they go viral, right? right. So so right. we like to say if you you see a show you know a video on our show on Monday, uh, it's going to have eight million views by Thursday. You know, not every time, but and it's just we're just a viral video entertainment newsroom, I guess is the way of putting it. I, the <laughs> most distinct way I can say it is I tell other people's stories quicker. <laughs> it's basically yeah. it. But it's a really, you know, I, what, I did the show for a couple of years before I actually caught an episode on television. And it was, uh, we don't do any advertising for our show. It's a show that you happen upon. You're flicking, right? You're watching, yeah. you're going through 400 channels and you'll get to right this minute. And there's always something crazy happening. And you stop. But the stories are only one to three minutes long before we move on to something else. So once we've got you, suddenly we're talking about a new story and then you're still watching. And then before you know it, the show's over. And it's like, it moves so fast. It goes, oh my God, there's an explosion. Look at this teeny tiny little kid. What a sweet story for this proposal. This tragic story of this guy who's dying and your emotions just like bang, 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 bang. And that's kind of what I realized makes a viral video. Because I'm, I'm a viral video expert now. This is my definition of what a viral video is. It is any video that gives you any emotional reaction. If it makes you angry, you're going to want to share it and see if other people are angry. If it makes you happy, you're going to want to share it and see if other people are happy about it. That's why we share stuff and get into the comments section. So if there's any video that gives you an emotional reaction, be it you get goosebumps, anger, you want to be sick, this, that, and the other, that's a viral video. I want to hit the pause button on television hosting real quick and go in a completely different direction guys please do and it's just gonna it'll be a quick question we don't have to take a lot of time with it i want to know and for anyone who's listening who might have seen as television host if you weren't to work in entertainment if you were to do something as different as possible from entertainment right what do you guys think that in a, another life you guys would have been out there doing uh see that's different see, it's is the question what would you have done or what would you do now because it's two Ooh. different answers for me. Because what Choose. I would have done. You get to pick, you pick which question you want. Well, at, at, at 18, I went to, to Hong Kong and it was my mum that sent me in. So basically, just said, um, sent me to a modeling agency, ambushed me, sent me to a modeling agency. And that's where my whole thing got started. I'm like, wow, what a stupid way to make money. But at that time, at 18, I was, I was meeting with um, the RAF liaison officer at school. And I was trying to become a fast jet pilot in the RA. Really? So yeah, wow. it's one of the like two wow. things I've ever wanted to do was to, to either fly jets, um, fly planes or, or get into television. And they both seemed so unlikely. And then, yeah, I was, so I was taking meetings with the RAF and I was looking into the idea that they could sponsor me through university. And then out of that, I'd get the opportunity to go and just fly really fast planes, which is just cool as shit. Jeez. And, but like I said, I, I went out, I'm 18. I, I got into modeling in that same six months I was in, in Hong Kong. I ended up being a bad guy in a Hong Kong action movie with Paul Rudd and Maggie Q. And I'm just getting, you know, paid just for me at 18. Like I got paid thousands of dollars. I'm like, wow, I'm rich. And so from that point on, I go, well, this is what I'm going to do. But if it was now, yeah, now if I could do now. something now. Um, I think it would be to work for a political campaign, um, mm. get involved in speech writing, get involved, or even just being like a, a press secretary for for a major campaign. Because living in America during the last four years has been absolutely mind blowing nuts. That I'm like to the point that I was saying to my wife, "Honey, why don't you run for office and I'll and I'll be I'll be your number two. Linda would be phenomenal. Uh, yeah. yeah in politics that's what i would do i think i i want or i go work for a, a non-profit i feel like at that point i'm hitting middle age man and i feel like i want to do something that that helps but yeah i feel like i i that's what i i want to sort of make a difference somewhere i like it justin Wanga's? what about you man oh <laughs> yeah, right. you, you want to go jb or you want me to uh, yeah oh, yeah i guess i'll go i don't know why, why um, I don't shoot, man. I don't know what I would have ended up doing had I not gotten to the entertainment industry. I think um, I think I would been like a. Uh, I think I would have ended up being a writer, like a travel writer, or a writer for different like editorials, magazines, some kind of journalism type thing. Uh, I, I imagine would have been my path because I was even doing a little bit of that in Bangkok while I was modeling there, and also, and I just you know I love traveling. It's just, I like to be on the move. So just, I, th I think I would have gone that direction. I like it. I think so. Um, writing. 
I can definitely see you doing that actually, especially given how much you like to read. You're pretty prolific. And, and just write. Yeah, no, you also, you also write some things at times as well. I do. Um, <laughs> for me, I think you guys both know that I loved teaching um, uh, as yes. a way to kind of subsidize yeah. my career in entertainment. But there's one thing kind of related to teaching that I would have loved to have done. Did you guys ever go to any science camps or summer camps when you guys were kids? Uh, mine were always kind of like adventure based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something like, like that. Yeah. I would have liked to have designed my own. You were, you were, you, you were like, and, you were like 22 and, when you did this? Is that? Me? Yeah. I did this like this almost every summer from the age of like 13 and oh, 15 or 16. I went to a 16. zoo camp when I was in elementary school for a couple <laughs> summers. Did they let no. you pet the animals? <laughs> we did all kinds of stuff. My mother would just drop me off at the zoo, the Fort Worth yeah. Zoo. And I, it was like a two week summer camp thing or four week. I don't know. I don't that, remember. That's but, what he yeah. was told. He was just left at the zoo. Or maybe <laughs> I was wandering around the zoo by myself. It's like my camp camp. It was, was it zero. was the it was it was the eighties. <laughs> exactly. Parents could just, just leave their kids' places then. You're good. You're all good. Go fine. It's it's amazing. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I'm amazed any of us survived. <laughs> like Seriously. the parenting back then. Like I remember like, oh man, I used to take this bus like six miles home and then because I used to get sent to a summer camp in Guildford when my parents were working. And then we'd get dropped off and then we'd immediately, as soon as we go, she gone? Cool. And we'd, we'd go back to the bus station. We'd take the bus back to our town. We'd walk back to our house. We'd break into the garage. And then we'd always find a window that was open. We'd break into a house. I remember once breaking on the second floor. And I almost fell. But we'd break into our own home. And then we'd sit there and play Super Nintendo all day. Yeah. <laughs> and then make food. And then mom would come back. And we were supposed to then. We had money for the bus. And we'd come home after camp. How was camp? Awesome. You guys would have been the worst campers ever. You guys are not allowed to my science camp, all right? So what did you do it's in your science happening. camp? Yeah, what's, so, it, what's it gonna be? I went to science camps a lot when I was a kid, and I was also a camp counselor at a, uh, for like three summers. And then I went to a, a camp, and this was a total kind of outdoor survivalist type camp. And the last thing we would do at the end of the camp was we went on like a five, six day trip where we would just pack everything we needed into our bags, like water filtration, foods, whatever. And we would just go out and take our canoes like out into the redwood forest and just just live and like awesome. camp in tents and, and get our own food. And I loved it. And it's like, I feel like it's so different from where my life ended up going that sometimes I just kind of miss the, the mm -hmm. outdoors simplicity well, of it. I love stuff like that. A very mm -hmm. defining memories for me when I was younger where I was challenged to, like you said, capsize a canoe, or, you know, we're gonna go, we're gonna walk up all these mountains, or we're gonna go and climb that cliff. And, and I was always like scared, but I always pushed myself. And I think that's kind of what pushed me into everything that we do. You need to have a certain amount of, well, it's scary, but it's exciting on the other side. If you just push through that fear, you can have a lot of fun in life. And I think it was from stuff just like that, Alan, when yeah. I was a kid adventures i like i love adventure i look at our careers in entertainment and i always said this i feel like our careers are adventures Very they're true. yeah they're journeys right and then the paths are not the same for any of us that's what's crazy about entertainment right other industries people have some of them have similar paths or maybe there's like oh, three you're a or four different paths oh, no. right you, you, and you know kind of what steps to take but man out of all of our friends that are entertainers every one of us has a wildly different and crazy path of an adventure yeah. right and a lot of us had times of like not having enough food or money or jobs um yeah. but that's part of the adventure right that's part of what's exciting about it. so <laughs> if, if, we, if we were to drop you off in the wilderness alone how long could you survive it depends on what you give me right do i have a ferro Nothing. rod we're not giving you fire? shit Oh, I'll call you that 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 can, night and tell you to come can pick we, me up. <laughs> can we hunt? What kind of environment would you fare the best in? Like what oh. ecosystem? What kind? Like, Interesting. A, a, a rainforest, a desert, yeah, yeah. the tundra. Okay, I would say probably beach resort. I would think I would do really like solid. You, I have a lot have of you heard of Acapulco? <laughs> oh, oh. No, I would love to visit at some point. I actually almost about. died in Acapulco. Wait, what? Freeze Alcohol frame? Poisoning? Um, well, okay, <laughs> I almost died a few times in Acapulco. Um, 
We were, it was 2000, this is in college, it's like 2004 or, or something, 2004, 2003, me and my buddy Payam took a bus, uh, Payam, it's an it's a like Iranian it. Persian name, me it's and my buddy name. Payam took a bus from Austin, Texas to Acapulco. That's a long ways. That was a full 25 hour bus ride. Oh my God. Straight through Mexico. We, we had no reservations. We were just meeting up friends that were on like a package deal for spring break there. And we decided like the day before, let's go meet up Ben. And so we go down there and um, we find a place kind of on the beach. I remember the first night we went to this club called the Palladium. And it's just Ooh. this mega club on this cliff in Acapulco. And I, the last thing I remember is all of us doing tequila shots with like chicks. And um, then I remember waking up on top of a van on the side of a cliff. Oh. So I wake up, the sun's rising. This dude is like, muevete, muevete. <laughs> I'm on his van. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> he's like, you, what? he's basically telling me Spanish, get off my van. And yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. And so I get up, I get off his van, quite kind of delirious. He drives off of, he drives away in my bed, essentially, for the night. <laughs> and then, and I'm, really, I'm on this like really steep hill. And there's like children in like their Catholic school outfits walking down the hill towards their Catholic school, I suppose. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, do you have, no, all your money's gone. I had a gold chain that was gone. And I was just kind of there, okay, so we're good. We're, we're gonna be <laughs> fine. We need to get back to the hotel. Where's that? And I start walking up the hill and I'm like, no, no. Hotel's by the beach. We should go back down it. And um, somehow I find the hotel. I don't know what happened to me. Dude, nobody this, nobody knows. Nobody has any recollection of where I went. I know where you went. You went to the van. Why? Well, we it, there's, don't there's, know. It's a solid eight-hour window, more than that, of just... So we don't know what time this is a good, the van. This is a good so, uh, story subject, because tell, uh, times you've nearly died. Oh, so I got I got one. This is cool. Yeah. No, this is this is exactly what you're talking about. The times you nearly died. For me, it was uh, in Phuket, and I was 20, I think. I had a girlfriend at the time from Hong Kong. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time in Phuket because uh, her family had like um, uh, a timeshare, like one of the resorts in Laguna. It's awesome. So you know, the way living in Asia. That's what I miss about living in Asia. Uh, mm. Should we just jump on a plane and go piss off to Thailand? Or you know, yeah. cool. Let's go do that. Whereas I don't really get to do that here. And so, um, so we were driving back from Patong to Laguna. And if, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a very windy road, very windy. And it's all along the coast. And at times it goes quite high and quite up, quite yeah. high, high up. And we've rented this really cool, like old American Jeep, you know, like one of the ones that looks like it's from the war kind of thing. It's great manual. It's got <laughs> and uh, my, my girlfriend had just started learning how to drive. And, um, and so we're on our way back and, uh, we get to this sort of like this moment and I just pull over randomly. It's very dark. It's late, late at night. It's like, you know, midnight or something and the moon's out. And I, and I pull over just randomly, just totally randomly pull over and I go, Hey, do you, uh, do you want to drive? Do you want to try driving? It's only, only a mile or so back and the road's empty. And she thinks about it. And then just as she's like, ah, we ended up, there's this tiny sprinkling of rain, like the tiniest bit, but this is an open top Jeep. Okay. So if it's, if it's Thailand rain, shit so it's like we immediately go okay never mind ollie let's just get back and so i start driving from this little pull-in and i just enter the road and the road is this it descends and it's basically a full sort of like hairpin mm -hmm. and as i hit the middle of this this corner only in second gear because i've just started at about 15 18 miles an hour i hit an invisible an invisible patch of of oil or something Ooh. and this four-wheel drive it just in the slowest thing you've ever done, it just starts sliding across uh, the road and it goes all the way around. There's nothing I can do. It's like it's on ice. And uh, we, we end up right on the lip of a 200 foot cliff. Oh my and, God. Like, 
And I tell you, the dream, I mean, I only saw the movie once, but that Final Destination movie, I had that dream that night that I cheated death and death was coming for me. Because like, why did I pull over at that time? Why did I stop and suggest that? And if it hadn't been for the rain, my girlfriend, who had no experience, would have been driving. What would have happened? There were no real seatbelts in this thing. It's open top. I was like, I came, it was just right on the edge of, oh shit. That was, uh, I almost just died. Cool. Anyway, let's get home. So I'm super happy that both of you guys are here with me today and able to talk and that neither of you is at the bottom of a cliff, dead. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you both got pretty close. So what about you? Come on. <laughs> What's your you almost, uh, give, give one almost died okay. story. Okay, I got one almost died story. And to be honest, I don't know how close I was to dying. It's possible that I just thought I was gonna die. What? I'm in Kuala Lumpur, uh, or not Kuala Lumpur, I'm near Kuala Lumpur at a place called, well, anyway, it's Sunway Lagoon in in malaysia mm -hmm. there's this like a uh, kind of just a really nice family oriented theme park right and i'm with mtv and we're trying to do like a promo thing for it and i have been chosen as the one vj to go bungee jumping and i've never gone bungee jumping before but i'm also pretty dim-witted sometimes about adventurous stuff i'm like yeah let's do it that sounds fun yeah. bungee jumping in malaysia sure they got me i'm i'm let's the same do as like, right let's do it let's just do it for tv yeah so I watch a couple people go off it and it's like this big kind of suspension bridge over like this big lagoon, right? Mm. And I watch people, a couple people do the jump, right? And it's all pretty much the same. They wrap your legs up very tightly in this harness and then you don't jump, you just kind of fall flat and you go down. And each person comes like maybe like 20 feet above the water, then it springs back up. So I'm looking at it and I've seen it before. And I'm like, you know what, I can do this. Am I scared? Hell yes, I'm scared. Do my parents want me to do this? No, they don't want me to do this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So I do the jump and everything is going really well during the first half a second. <laughs> but as I'm getting closer to the water, I'm noticing there's, no, there's nothing pulling my ankles back up. I don't feel any like resistance it's a at boing. all. There should, there should be a boing here. Yeah. You know what? I didn't even hear a boing because a split second later, <laughs> my head was submerged underwater. Mm. Like I actually hit the water and I went in like almost my whole body into the water. And then I feel it and it jerks me back up into the sky. And I, no one had touched the water before. I'd watched plenty of people do this. Everyone clears the water by a lot. And I'm, I they literally- didn't, They didn't uh, acclimate for your weight. Yeah. They no, they what calculated happened, wrong. No, what happened is that my producer told them to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They asked him, they asked him like, do you want him to touch the water? And the producer like put him all the way in. Uh, well, well yeah. what, one thing, thing, first of all, I didn't realize they were, they could calculate it so yeah. exactly to where you could do yeah. that. And it's I'm a different pretty... size and weight, right? Like you mentioned. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, and I've done a bungee jump where they asked me, I said, do you want to, do you want to go into the water? I went, uh, oh, yeah, you have? Yeah. yeah oh, don't, okay. So you know what I'm talking about. So they can, yeah. so they can do that safely. Yes. And no, but as long as they get right. the calculations right. You know, so yeah, I did it into a, 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 where I went about halfway in. It's kind of just goes right up your nose once it yanks you out. But you knew um, you were going to hit the water. That's the yeah, difference. Yeah, that, that was cold-blooded. For someone to spring that on you, I honestly, I'm calling that some bullshit right there. But that's the kind of shit you have to put up with on Asian television. They'll it's try and kill you. It happens all the time. They put Justin in a situation where he almost killed someone. Yeah, but like, I was down. He was, was so down, down, down to almost kill people. He was, was I, I, had drill. I had a drill next to this beat in the guy's head. Oh, shit, guys had. I saw that. Yeah. No, dude, the one with the knife for Alan as well. I mean, Alan's yeah. face is pissed. Alan was not happy. I called you afterward, Ollie. I yeah. called you from Asia. I'm like, Ollie, I'm so mad. And Ollie's yeah. like, you have Alan to was down. losing his shit after, uh, what was his name? He was uh, from Kuala Lumpur, the magician yeah, with the was. knife. He was uh, Andrew Lee. Andrew He's Lee. One of your friends. Great yeah. guy, actually. Great, he, great he trick. Was, it was Great a trick, trick, Alan. I know, I know. It was actually beautiful on TV. But the drill into the forehead of the monk or into the temple of the monk, yeah. I was so that, worried you were, about you, Justin. You were really upset about that, too. I was, I was also very upset very about that. I was, That's uncomfortable TV. I thought it was great. <laughs> Justin well, it's great it. television because you, yeah. what I mean, you've got is everyone's reacting like that at home oh, as well. They're oh, screaming yeah. at the TV. They can't get oh, enough. Yeah. I mean, he was fine. He had a little flesh wound at his temple. Oh, he was, he was bleeding when he walked oh, out. He, he was bleeding. We... Yeah, you, we broke you flesh. Dude, but I mean, that's what happens like, when you they, have they somebody me, with a drill bit next to your head and he was forcing it in there. 
Jesus, what is wrong with people? Actually, crazy. Yeah, and I, then I, I think remember. afterwards they said that I did something wrong. <laughs> you didn't right? kill the guy on camera. And I was Justin. like, no. You were supposed to drill the guy. <laughs> yeah, he was supposed to die, Justin. That's the point. He, he lived. That's not, we, that we, we need this to go viral. We need death. Actually, do you remember that they actually, well, I don't know how much we should say about the show because not all of it aired, but that was a very uh, passionate performance by these Thai monks. And they were, were they from Thailand, Justin? No, I think, I think they were monks from Vietnam. Oh, were they Vietnamese? Yeah, you're they're right. Vietnamese. They were Vietnamese monks. But man, well, they, the Thai they were all in, man. They were yeah. all about what they were doing. Uh, they oh, really wanted to go through. Um, I think they were a little too, little too gruesome for the judges. It's just, honestly, it sounds, it's, I did, I really did want to do that show. It would have been like, it, it did look like a lot of fun. Again, thank you for giving us your work, Ollie. We really appreciate it. You had another job it's we not, wouldn't have had if you hadn't left no, America. It's like I always told you as well, like that's another one of my little wisdom things about, about our industry is sometimes people will come up and go, oh man, you stole my job or you got my job. And I go, and I tell you that like, it's not your job unless you get it. Yeah. You, you got the job. I didn't. It wasn't me. I was never the host of that. It's like things work out the way they work out. Like if you... Look into how many people were cast before Keanu Reeves in The Matrix. The, the sheer many? number of people who turned it down. DiCaprio yeah. turned it down. Sandra Bullock turned it down. Will Smith turned it down. Like they went for just every big name out there all turned it down. And bottom of the barrel was, was, was Keanu Reeves. But he was perfect for it. You know what I mean? So like the casting yeah. process for anything, it's whatever the end result is. You know, you know what? Speaking of Matrix, Ollie, and I know you know this already. I'm sure you've read about it, but I just read about this. Justin, have you heard that the Matrix was originally supposed to be about, and I want to get it right. I'm not sure if it was about being non-binary or if it was about trans. being transsexual. It's, was it being about it's trans? A, it's, no, allegorical, it's an allegorical representation of being trans because both the writer's directors, both the writer directors are trans. Yeah. You yeah. Know, they transitioned oh. Anna and Lana Wachowski. They were the Wachowski brothers when they right. made Matrix, but now they've both transitioned. And um, I, I hope I got their names right. I know Lana's one of them. But yeah, they're making, right. ma they're making Matrix 4 now. Are they really? Yeah. yeah. Dude, yeah. They've Fantastic. got Ke Keanu and Carrie. I mean, I don't know how, considering that, spoiler alert, they die. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's like, I don't know. It's I'm, I'm pretty Matrix. interested. To, yeah, I love it. Just see yeah. what they do with it. Apparently, the original script was uh, was that character was supposed to tra uh, yeah transform into a woman when he was awoken into the real world, but been played by a man when he was still inside the Matrix. See, which I cool. thought, yeah, even outside mm. of the the trans allegory, like I just think that is a fascinating. That would have been story. a bloody cool idea. Yeah. That yeah, right? that you were in the Matrix as a as a the the wrong sex. That's fascinating. That Crazy. actually would have been, in my opinion, an even better movie. Yeah, because you could so. have two great actors and you yeah. could have brought those characters together. That would yeah. have been fantastic. That would have been super cool. Wow. We have covered a lot here, Justin. Are we should wrap we... this up. We've been going for like two, over two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, are, are you, are you, you said you've been practicing your editing, so you're going to cut it down to a really funny 50 minutes. No, Alan's editing this one. Well, see, yes. do all the stuff no, we I, talked I, about I nearly really dying. Am. I really am. But that yeah. was some good shit. If there's anything you don't want in this episode, Ollie, I don't care. It's going in. <laughs> I can't wait to add the kittens and the explosions on either right. side. Of so you. are we talking <laughs> kittens on the right and then explosions on the left? Or do Dude, you want explosions combine on the, them the right? Two. It'll just switch. Oh, just and then bl blow up the oh, kittens. There you go. Exploding kittens. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that will for sure get us yeah. some terrible attention online. It will definitely go hey, viral. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Hey, guys, are we podcasting yet? Dun -dun. I, I don't know, Ollie. Did. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Like seriously, Ollie, we Thanks, really dude. appreciate it. Yeah, it's been no. really fun. Hey, man. Well, I check my schedule, and seeing as I've got fuck all to do for the foreseeable future, mm. if you want to do this weekly, I can do it. I've got <laughs> nothing else. <laughs>